This is Dr. Don Fowler in his teaching on Old Testament backgrounds. This is session number six, End of Royal Divinization, The Amorites. Welcome back. We are continuing our presentation, I hope in simple terms, trying to explain to you how the ancients thought uh, in their world of religion as opposed to ours. And so yesterday I was using some key words that uh, I will need to uh, keep in front of you. And those key words are words like control, manipulation, and sympathetic magic. And, uh, <clears throat> and so um, what, we, what we saw in their in their thinking uh, yesterday, was the unique place of the king <coughs> in, um, in how religion was designed to work. And so, um, so let me grab a, uh, a marker and... The thought pattern seems to be something like this. They conceived of these two worlds, and this world is the world of the gods, and this world is the world of humans. And what really separated them was some sort of chasm. And so what pagan thought was doing, apparently, was trying to figure out a way to bridge the chasm from this world to this world. And obviously, humans in in antiquity could not get into heaven or the heavens. But because the heavens were filled with gods, gods could get into the world of humans. So what religion was designed to do was to reverse this arrow so that they could then bring so that they could then bring the world of the gods into their world and and so what has been happening for several millennia is uh, an increasing centralization in the person of the king and what we have reached is this place where the king becomes the most important person in bridging that gap between the heavens and the earth. And what we saw last time is the place of this thing called the, the uh, sacred marriage, where in this sacred marriage, the, the king could produce fertility for his land and in their thought, one did this by acting out magically what one wanted, since the sexual act was a means of perpetuating fertility. You can't have children without a sexual act. Children represent fertility. So by engaging in sexuality with a religious figure like the high priestess of Ishtar, the king then magically could transfer to earth the prosperity that was so essential to their way of thinking about religion. So this is uh, called sympathetic magic, and it's a case of the, the king magically acting out the desired intent. Um, human beings have done this, I think, on various kinds of ways, but all, I think, at their core, the same, uh, throughout the world. And by magically acting out what a person wants, then they can create a, a situation favorable to the worshiper. Okay? So what we tried to make the point last uh, lecture was the point that 
in the ancient world, they were not all that interested in aesthetics. They were interested in very concrete survival issues like prosperity and longevity. And so the king had now been able to assume this all-important role as the grantor of prosperity and long life for his people. So this is a characteristic of paganism that I think makes its way through the Old Testament, not because the, in the Old Testament tradition we have kings who have assumed the role of deities, although we do have several places that fudge in that area, but because of this concept that through magic you can actually transform situations so that the world of the heavens can be brought down or encouraged to come down into the, into the earthly world. So the control factors, the, the words are, human beings in pagan thought are in control of the gods somehow. The way that they are in control of the gods is by manipulating the gods. And the philosophy of this is sympathetic magic. So, the Israelites seem to have been susceptible to these sexual rites which were common in the Canaanite world. For example, we know that there was sacral, sacral prostitution. We actually have a separate Hebrew word for uh, sac- sacred prostitution. Um, when Judah went down... Uh, to visit, uh, uh, and he ended up with Tamar, he went down to find a kodcha, a sexual prostitute. So they seem to think that people who were designated holy people could effectively bridge this distance between the heavens and bring about fertility. If I could uh, do a little bit of further thinking before we leave this subject area, since I think it's at the core of why the Israelites were so susceptible to the Canaanite model, it would go something like this. In cause-effect thinking, it's magical. If you can figure out the cause, you can produce the effect. So in modern forms of Christianity... The cause, in pagan thinking, remember, humans are in control. So the cause in pagan thinking can be human good works. I remember when I had become a Christian 50 years ago, I ended up, uh, along with my wife-to-be, in a very, very hyper-conservative Christian campus. There was... Nothing worse on that campus than either sexual sins or going to movies. And uh, if you went to a movie and you got caught, you were kicked out of school. So uh, my senior year, I was home for the Christmas break, and I decided I wanted to see this movie. It was an erotic thriller movie. This has been 45 years ago. And so I remember sneaking into the movie uh, theater, doing everything I could, waiting till the movie started when it was dark, and walking in and grabbing my seat, and and I was feeling nervous, and and uh, well, to do away with the suspense, the erotic thriller was *Sound of Music*, and in that uh, thriller. Uh, Julie Andrews had just fallen in love with the Baron. And, you know, she was kind of a wannabe nun. She wanted to be a nun, but she didn't really have the ability to do so. So she had now fallen in love with the Baron, and she was out in the garden, out in his mansion, and she was singing to God at this new turn of events that had shaped her life into just uh, unparalleled joy.
And as she was singing with that fabulous voice of Julie Andrews, she was singing to God about his blessing as, I must have done something good. There's a fine line between doing good works that God tells us to do versus thinking that by doing the good works, you can bring about divine intervention on your behalf. Isn't that just subtle how that can be? All of us are called to do good works. Paul himself said, don't grow weary doing well. But pagan thought sees good works as the ability to manipulate God to produce a desired effect. And so where we're at now in human history is that the king is the, the being who can manipulate the gods and bring about the desired effect. Well, this cause-effect thinking is effective only as long as the king produces. And so we mentioned last time that the, the, king, um, the king obviously could not do that uh, perpetually. So... I mentioned in our class notes, of some importance, uh, we deal with this question, how does this correlate with the Hebrews in general and the Western Semites in particular? Well, divinization of kings never developed in the West. And I mentioned to you in red, so that you'll be sure to see it, I mentioned to you in red the word topography, Because, in essence, topography is probably the reason why it never developed in the West. There were not the massive populations in the West that we had in the East. The cities were smaller, the population was smaller, uh, it was more difficult to unite into large political entities, So I think because of the different topography in the West, we have a decent explanation for why kings in the West were never uh, divine. But I'd like to make a distinction for us before we leave this, and that is this. There is a distinction between a divine king and a sacred king. Sacral kingship is the idea that a king is uniquely chosen by God. And that was a perspective that both Mesopotamia and the West, including the Hebrews, had about their kings. Kings were sacral, they were chosen by God, and therefore only God was the being who could um, or should remove them from office. You might remember reading in the biblical text, the story of David and Saul. And in that text, you can't help but be impressed with the fact that Saul had in numerous ways disqualified himself as king, and yet David could not bring himself to remove him from the throne because he was uniquely anointed by God, that is, Saul was. Saul anointed, Saul was anointed by God, and God would have to remove Saul himself. So, in the Western tradition, the king never assumed the exact magical status of being the unique bridge between heaven and earth, but he was also different than all other people because in the West, the king, just as in the East, the king was chosen by God and therefore was uniquely holy and sacral. Now, holy doesn't always mean, in the way we use that word in English today, holy means he's, you know, the holier he is, the less sinning he has in his life. Uh, That's not really the way the word tends to work in the Hebrew Bible. Holy in the Hebrew Bible is a word that means something at its base, 
more like uniquely set apart. And so Saul, as the first king, was uniquely set apart, and therefore he was not to be uh, harmed. So this whole concept of the king as a magical figure is going to change very quickly in Mesopotamian history. And so what we are going to see is that when the Ur-3 period comes to an end, for the most part, the concept of divinization of kings will come to an end as well. Following the fall of the Ur-3 civilization, which you might remember from, yeah, from the previous class, was the end of the Sumerian civilization. Um, there was a city called Isin where kings continued to be divinized, but there was no longer an empire and these kings were limited to the city of Isis. We also know that in southern Iran, at the site of Elam, a nation a state, kings continued to be divinized there as well. But the fact of the matter is, following the collapse of the Ur-3 civilization, then that was the end of the divinization of, uh, of kings. Uh, the Elamites invaded um, Mesopotamia, sacked the city of Ur, ended the Ur-3 period, and so from that, <coughs> from that time onward, we have uh, the collapse of the divinization of earthly kings in Mesopotamia. Now, before I leave it, let me just tell you, there is a unique exception in the West, and that was what was going on in Egypt, because in Egypt, right from the beginning of kingship, kings were not just divine, they were incarnate divinity. And in the unique Egyptian thought, each king was simply a reincarnation of the previous king. In that sense of the word, all Egyptian kings were divine because all Egyptian kings were incarnation of Amun-Re, the uh, Egyptian uh, sun god. That's a unique divinization that occurred nowhere else in antiquity but in Egypt. So, the Ur-3 period comes to an end. This is the period that time-wise Abraham uh, belonged in. Abraham was born, uh, according to the conservative dating system of the Old Testament, in 2166, which means that his lifespan correlated exactly with the Ur-3 period. Abraham left uh, his homeland at the ripe young age of 65 or 66, thereabouts, uh, pushing 70, and uh, made his way uh, to the west. And, uh, but Mesopotamia, as he left it, entered into a period of several hundred years, and we're not going to talk about that simply because we need to move along in order to cover the contents of the course. But for the next several hundred years, the Mesopotamian basin was divided, disunited largely north and south, but there were multiple political uh, entities. And it was not until the rise of uh, Hammurabi that uh, Mesopotamia is united. So the background of the patriarchal period is what I call the Old Babylon, or what is called the Old Babylonian period. All right? So setting our stage, the Old Babylonian period is primarily a period that can best be called Amorite. Now, the Amorites are one of those people groups of the Old Testament that, um, <clears throat> that we read about uh, throughout the Old Testament, but it's a little confusing. Or actually, it may be a lot confusing. So I'm not sure if I can get this across to you. 
But we have this word called Amorite, but it has multiple possible meanings, and only context can determine what that word actually means. So one of the common designations is that Amorite, or Amuru, is a geographical term, which in the language of the day just meant a Westerner, someone from Syro-Palestine, if you will. This geographical perspective, therefore, had less to do with the people group and more from the fact that the Amorites were people who came to Mesopotamia from the west, the, what, the modern area of Lebanon and Syria. So that was one of the designations for, or one of the meanings for the word Amorite. A second possible meaning for the word Amorite is what I call the ethnic perspective. They are first mentioned in Sumerian tablets from the Old Akkadian period. Within another one and a half century, the Old Akkadian period at the time of Sargon the Great, right around 2350. So within another one and a half centuries, the inhabitants of Mesopotamia are forced to build a wall to uh, restrain them or to keep them out of Mesopotamia. Assyrian merchants up in southern Turkey, Cappadocia, have an occasional Amorite name, so they didn't just settle when they left uh, Syro-Palestine, they didn't just settle in Mesopotamia, but they settled up in southern Turkey as well. In, by the old Babylonian period, and we can think of an easy date to remember when that period started, because uh, Hammurabi uh, would have begun his reign in 1776. So that's a convenient date for Americans. It helps us remember it because of the foundation of our own country. So um, they are uh, synthesized uh, with the uh, local population. And, uh, and so, um, so this is, uh, this is a, a people group that are called Amorites, and we'll talk about them uh, in, a, in a little bit more. Uh, there is a third group, or I should say a third designation, uh, designated meaning for the term. It's what I call the socioeconomic perspective. In other words, in Mesopotamia, they would use the term Amorite to describe any f- foreigner who had moved into their territory so that it really wasn't talking about a very specific people called the Amorites, but it was used to describe any foreigner. Maybe a corollary term in our modern culture would be how we might use the word Mexican to describe uh, people who have immigrated into our country. In actuality, we sloppily use the term Mexican to describe any Hispanic, and some of those Hispanic people could be from Nicaragua, Nicaragua or Honduras or uh, other places. And Americans just sloppily use the term uh, Mexican. Well, they seem to have used the term Amorite in the same way. So if in their population area there were foreigners, they called them Amorites even when they weren't necessarily Amorites. The one that interests us the most is the way the Bible uses the term. The term Amorite in the Bible appears 86 times. All but 13 of those 86 appearances occur in the first seven books of the Old Testament. Well, that's because the Amorites belong in the earliest stages of the Old Testament, not the latest stage. Now, what we can tell you is that there was a people group in the Bible that would be called Amorites, but interestingly enough, in today's world, they are known better as the Hyksos. So let me see if I can explain this to you in a uh, coherent way. I'm going to erase my board. And uh, and try to explain this term Hyksos. Uh, 
Hyksos is another word for Amorite, and I have it uh, in our class notes up there. Hyksos is, of all things, uh, a, uh, an Egyptian word, and in Egyptian, I do not actually read Egyptian. It was one of my life um, goals to learn Egyptian, but as you can plainly see on the screen, I am running out of life to learn Egyptian. It's, a, it's an important language, and Egyptian, this term means chiefs of foreign lands. Chiefs of foreign lands. For the first time in Egyptian history, Egypt was invaded by an outside power. And these outside people were called by them in typical fashion, by the way, in terms of who their kings were. So they didn't call them by their ethnic name, which was Amorite. They called them instead, in terms of their kings, chiefs of foreign lands, which is the word Hyksos. At a later date, much later date, a Jewish historian named Josephus, who in the great revolt against Rome was a commander of the Galilean forces, uh, he survived that horrific revolt against Rome and became a Romanophile and, and wrote a history of the Jews. And in the history of the Jews, he came across this term Hyksos, but by Josephus' time, which would have been 68 to 70 or, and the years after 70, by Josephus' time, he had, lost, he had lost the meaning of the word Hyksos. And so he read it as shepherd king. So, when you're reading older works on uh, the history of Israel, you'll sometimes see these Amorite people referred to in Egyptian history as the shepherd kings, when in reality, that's a misreading of the term. So, this great Hyksos empire was actually Amoritic in origin, and so the, the Bible uh, uses that term to describe them as, uh, as people of uh, Amoritic origin. So if I can show you uh, on the map, we'll use this one to illustrate what's happened. I don't know how well you can see my cursor on the screen, but in the years say, 1800 down to about 1600, the Amorite people who emanated from this region right here, the Am Amorite people had been able to create an empire that stretched all the way from this region up here, controlled all of Syro-Palestine, and ruled Egypt to about the middle of Egypt. This great empire, the Egyptians came to call Hyksos, but in actuality, it was an Amorite uh, period. So these Amorites were a remarkable people. They managed to uh, create the world's first um, empire in Egypt that was not Egyptian. They conquered Egypt, made a lasting impression on the Egyptians. And then they also emigrated from this region up here in Syro-Palestine. Much earlier, they emigrated into Mesopotamia in the old Babylonian period. So it's very confusing, and the Bible uses the term, the Bible uses the term Amorite in the kinds of ways that are confusing, because sometimes it means the people, people, 
and sometimes it means uh, a geographical location. So if I could return to my class notes then, I would try to show you that when the Bible uses the term Amorite, it means in part the people who were behind the great Hyksos empire which ruled Egypt. When the Bible wasn't using it that way, then it tended to use it as a counterpart to the word Canaanite. So I know this is a a little confusing because it's like the Old Testament itself. There's so much to learn, it's just overwhelming. But the word Canaanite was also used geographically as well as ethnically. And so in the Hebrew Bible, Canaanite could mean a very specific group of Semitic-speaking peoples, or it can mean people who live geographically in the coastal plain. Amorite can mean a very specific Semitic-speaking people who came from the Syro-Lebanon area, or it could be used geographically of people who lived in the mountains of Israel. So sometimes Amorite simply meant not a people, but people who, but the inhabitants who lived in the mountain range of Israel. Canaanite could be a people, but it could also just be a term to describe the inhabitants of the uh, coastal plain. So the Bible uses the term Amorite a little bit similar to the way that the Mesopotamians used it, both geographically as well as uh, ethnically. We should uh, talk a little bit about these Amorite people before we leave this subject area because they were a remarkable people. People ask the question, the Egyptian Empire was one of the most impressive empires of all antiquity. It was certainly the longest lived of all empires, perhaps uh, on earth. Uh, The Egyptian empire lasted um, millennia, uh, nearly three millennia, two and a half millennia. Um, How is it that these foreigners from Syro-Palestine managed to conquer them? And how is it that they became prevalent in Israel itself? Well, there are some explanations which I can tell you that help explain, one of which is because the Amorites were physically larger than the inhabitants of both Canaan and Egypt. When we're able to find Amorite skeletons, what we find is that, to speak in rough terms, they're about half a head taller than the other population groups. Uh, In a world like theirs, physical strength played a bigger part in warfare than it does in today's world, Modern In modern warfare, it really doesn't, most of the time, it doesn't matter how strong you are. It matters how many bullets your machine gun can shoot per minute. In the ancient world, this was a tremendous advantage in warfare because they were so much larger and stronger than the other population groups. I would guess, I would guess that the Egyptian build was that the average male was somewhere roughly at the bottom margins, five foot, and at the taller margins, five foot six. So to come across large numbers of opponents who averaged six foot gave these Amorites a tremendous advantage. 
But that wasn't all there was to it. The Amorites had somehow gotten a leg up on technology, um, and they were able to uh, introduce weaponry that made a huge difference in battle. Um, They were the first peoples to introduce uh, the horse as a as an animal connected to a chariot. In other words, they introduced chariot warfare on a large scale in Egypt, and the chariot was a terror weapon, especially when driven by horses. Now, you might remember in several earlier lectures, I showed you a Sumerian war chariot. Friends, that chariot was drawn by a donkey. Now, a donkey's a little beast. Strong, but little. The horse is, of course, powerful and strong and can pull a larger chariot and pull it much faster. So, this gave the Amorites a tremendous uh, advantage in war with the Egyptians. And, by the way, would introduce a method of warfare that would continue to dominate the ancient world right down into the pages of the New Testament period. A second important factor in why these Amorites were able to dominate their world, and by the way, I didn't make it clear, but I can tell you that not only did they have an empire that ruled Syro-Palestine and Egypt, but they became the dominant ethnic population in the empire of Hammurabi, the the old Babylonian period. They were remarkable people. Um, A second major military invention that uh, I I don't know how to evaluate which was more effective, but they created a brand new bow. In antiquity, bows were always made from single pieces of wood. Then that wood could be shaved down so that it could be pliable enough to be bent. So that if you were looking at the bow, the bow might look like something like this. And then when the individual pulled the bow, the bow would stretch like this. And the physics of the act of shooting such a bow meant The power of the thrust of the arrow depended largely upon the strength of the person pulling the bowstring. The further you could bend the piece of wood, the greater velocity you could let fly with the arrow. Now, there were other factors that would, you know, for example, what wood were you using? Some wood inherently had more thrust to it than others, but largely... Your, the thrust of your arrow depended on the strength of the person pulling the bowstring. Well, somehow the Amorites had created or come across a new technology. I'll give you a, a kind of a blow-up of it. As you can plainly see, you know that why I majored in Hebrew and not in art. Um, I, I have zero art, uh, art skills. But I'm going to give you a blow-up of what Uh, an Amorite bow look like because what they did is they created a piece of wood which was laminated with various layers. These layers were then glued together and compacted. Most of the layers would be wood. Some of the layers would be bone. But they created a weapon that had dramatically higher velocity than the simple single pieces of wood. Now, in warfare, this laminated bow was a tremendous advantage. You know, theoretically, you could have Amorite forces here and Egyptian forces here, and theoretically, the the Amorites could let their arrows fly (laughs) 
20 yards further away than the Egyptians could reach the Amorites. So they could start killing large numbers of Egyptian infantry before the Egyptian uh, bowmen had a chance to engage and reach them. This uh, superior weaponry gave them a tremendous advantage uh, between the, the, the chariot and the, um, and the uh, laminated bow. This gave them tremendous uh, advantage. They also uh, created a, a more effective uh, dagger, which meant that when they did close forces so that you were in hand-to-hand -hand combat, this dagger gave them an advantage in, in hand-to-hand. -hand. The Egyptians employed a thing that was called a mace. And a mace, their primary weapon was a mace, and it was a piece of very hard, heavy rock, like basalt or something like that, in which they would drill a hole and insert a piece of wood and the way that the Egyptians fought their battles for a thousand years was relying largely on this mace head. And so what you can see is that it killed by blunt force. You know, you would hit your opponent in the head and crush his skull and kill him. Well, this is probably because the Egyptians did not have access to metal with the ease that some of the other cultures did. So the mace long outlived its effectiveness and was no match for the, um, uh, for the Hyksos power. So these Hyksos, or Amorites, uh, simultaneously were ruling Egypt. At the same time, they were also part of the dominant ethnic group back in Babylon. A remarkable people, hugely important in the Bible, but rarely do we know much about them. Let me tell you quickly how the Bible remembers them. If uh, I have several passages here that I think it's uh, worth taking a little bit of our class time to read. In Amos, who speaks about them from memory, he writes concerning God defeating the Amorites through Moses and Joshua. And he says, yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, though his height was like the height of cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. I even destroyed his fruit above and his root below. God demonstrates to Israel his faithfulness to Israel by defeating the, uh, uh, the Amorites through uh, the, the leadership of Joshua. Um, I personally think that this has led to the confusion uh, that is sometimes represented in English translations where certain words are translated as giants, and I have a suspicion that they weren't giants in any sense of that term. I think it's perhaps a reference to people like the Amorites who were so much taller uh, than the ancient inhabitants. So whatever the case, they were one of the most remarkable people of Old Testament times. And God cites his defeat of them as an example of God's own greatness. We know another important uh, passage about them in Joshua, and I turn you to, uh, to uh, Joshua chapter 11, verse 10, because there was a capital to the Amorite Empire. In Joshua eleven ten. 10, uh, well, let's just read uh, verse 9. And so Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. He's likely talking about the remnants of the Amorite Empire. And uh, then Joshua uh, turned back at that time in verse 10, and he captured Chazor, uh, 
and struck its king with the sword, for Chazor formerly was head of all of these kingdoms. All right? I think with a, a very high level of probability, I think that he's talking about uh, Chazor, which was a city right about here, and he's telling us that Chazor was the capital of the Hyksos Empire. So as you could see, Chazor, if you see where my cursor is at, is sort of equidistant between the northern confines of the Amorite Empire and the southern confines, which would be Egypt. Right in the middle was Chazor, the great city that Joshua captured, in many ways, the greatest military event of the Israelites was the capture of the city of Chatzor. We use the word tel, it's an Arabic word, and it means mound. Uh, In the ancient world, all of the ancient cities produced mounds. And as they built these uh, cities... Much of the cities were built of mud brick, but over the millennia, and they would almost always build them on a hill, but over the years, the human population would build layer after layer of stratigraphy so that the mound would keep getting larger and larger, and the larger the city, the larger the mound. Well, the city of Chatzor was such a powerful city that it's, I would say, three times the size of the next mound in all of Syro-Palestine. So when Joshua captured Chatzor, this was a protean event, but unless somebody explains that to us, I don't know how we would know that. So this was a great event to capture an Amorite city by the Hebrews, because the Hebrews had none of the Ammonite, a- Amorite weaponry. The Hebrews did not have horses, they did not have chariots, they did not have laminated bows, and yet they were able to capture the uh, site of, uh, of Chatzor. So somewhat later, I'll show you a, uh, a map of, uh, the, of the great uh, Hyksos Empire, but uh, for now, let's, uh, let's turn our attention then and go back uh, from the Amorites. So as I synthesize this for you, I know it's confusing. The Bible talks about them a lot. They were hugely important, both in Mesopotamia and in, in the West. They were the first people group to conquer Egypt, although not Egypt in its entirety. So let's take that information and then go to the old Babylonian period, which is a time period that would stretch from roughly 1800, 1776, down to about 1600, a little less than 200 years. So the old Babylonian period is also occasionally known as the Ice and Larza period. Um, And we aren't going to talk about that 200-year period from the collapse of the Ur-3 period, because it's confusing. I find it interesting, but we want to talk about uh, how this reveals the Old Testament to us. So we're going to begin with Hammurabi the Amorite. Now, the cuneiform sign can be read as a B or a P. So sometimes you'll see Hammurabi, and sometimes you'll see Hammurabi. It's because the Canaanite, or excuse me, the cuneiform sign can be read B or P. It actually has a technical name called the B-P phonetic interchange, because if you watch it on my lips, B and P, it's a sound that's made right here with our lips. So it was amorphous, uh, 
uh, I think it was probably Hammurabi than B, but whatever the case, Hammurabi was an Amorite, or at least from Amorite extra, eb, uh, extract. Um, when Hammurabi took the throne of Babylon, Mesopotamia was federated into multiple regions. That the area was ripe for conquest may be seen in this quotation. There is no king who can be mighty alone. Behind Hammurabi, the man of Babylon, marched 10, 15 kings. Be, uh, as many marched behind Rimsin, the man of Larza, Ibal Piel, the man of Eshnuna, Amut Piel, the man of Katunum, and behind Yaramlim marched a fi- 20 kings. Well, what that quotation is telling us is that when Hammurabi took the throne of Babylon, There were half a dozen political entities which pretty much uh, balanced each other out. No one was powerful enough to control Mesopotamia. Well, when a man like Hammurabi uh, rises to a position of power, there are a large number of factors which must be considered. Perhaps one of the most important was the death of Shamshadad, the king of Mari, during Hammurabi's tenth year. This clearly opened the way for a strong leader such as Hammurabi. While he was not the first king of Babylon, he was the first Babylonian king to rule a unified Mesopotamia. So, it appears that what happened was this. Mesopotamia was federated, equally divided between a half a dozen city-states, and when Shamshadad, which shares a northern border with Babylon, when Shamshadad died, that created a domino effect so that Hammurabi was able to take over that region. He combined that region with his region and one by one succeeded in conquering those other city-states until just like that, Mesopotamia now is reunited again uh, under one political entity. All right, so let's see if I can just refresh your memory by pointing this out then. The first empire to rule all of Mesopotamia was the old Akkadian Empire in the person of Sargon the Great. That lasted from roughly 2350 to to uh, uh, 2200 or so. Then following that, it was the Ur-3 period, which went from 2150 to 2050. Now we have the Old Babylonian uh, period, which goes from roughly 1800 to 1600. This is therefore the third empire that is ruling Mesopotamia. And the reason that it's worth pointing all of this out to you is that the Old Babylonian period is the period in ancient history that best corresponds to the patriarchal period. In other words, people like uh, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph fit better socially, religiously, linguistically they fit into this time period that we would call the Old Babylonian period better than any of the other earlier ones that we talked about. So, some uh, contributions of uh, the Hammurabian uh, period uh, I've listed for you. Uh, Maybe I won't talk about these uh, as much. Um, The period of Hammurabi was a period that led to a dramatic uh, increase in construction and architecture in the city of Babylon. Uh, Babylon was greatly enlarged. Many temples were built. Canals were dug. So it was a time period of prosperity for the city of Babylon. You know, these Amorites, we wish we knew more about them. They must have just been a truly remarkable people. At any rate... Uh, great strides were taken toward the development of a calendar. For centuries, the 
the calendar of the Mesopotamians was the lunar calendar, and the way the the moon appears is such that it it can you cannot keep track accurately of what we call years through a lunar calendar. So the Venus tablets of Amisaduka are uh, are moving toward a solar calendar, which is uh, of course the one that. Uh, we follow. Um, Hammurabi is uh, the greatest of the ancient lawgivers. I would happen to think that Moses was far greater, but out of the those who um, who, le- who left us law codes, Hammurabi's law code is by far the most famous. Uh, it's uh, larger than any of the other law codes. So Hammurabi uh, was a great king, and great king leave law codes. The uh, the Amorite worldview fits so nicely with the worldview of the Bible. Linguistically, Amorite is fairly close to uh, Hebrew. As you can tell, my computer font can't read Hebrew. And so uh, I had written the Hebrew in here, uh, but my particular font couldn't read it. But I was pointing out to my students through personal names how close the Amorite language is to the Hebrew language. And uh, we can see this in personal names and place names and other evidences. So linguistically, Amorite and Hebrew are sister languages. Geographically, the connections with the patriarchs are impressive. For example, when we read important passages, which we'll talk about later because Later on, we're going to talk about the homeland of Abraham and where he came from. But when we look at sites like Haran and Tel Serugi and Tel Turaki and Tel Nahor, these latter three sites are etymologically identical to uh, forefathers of Abraham uh, named Serug and Terah and uh, Nahor. So we're just pointing out that the cities that are mentioned up in the northern part of Mesopotamia are etymologically identical to some of Abraham's relatives, showing you once again this similarity, this close relationship between Amorite and the Hebrew background. Socially, the parallels are truly impressive. We could cite several the gruesome passage in Judges chapter 19, in which uh, in order to get the Israelites to muster in the civil war, the Levite cuts his murdered concubine into 12 pieces and sends a tribe, a piece of her to each tribe. Well, this gruesome practice, it turns out, we know from Mari uh, examples, was a way of ordering tribes to send troops to the king who is ready to conduct a military campaign. So uh, we have we have many such uh, practices. Uh, I think I'm going to hurry along because we're almost done with um, uh, the hour that we have set aside for this lecture. Uh, a powerful area of s- similarity between uh, the old Babylonian period and the Bible is economics. Uh, Crown land and its sale was similar. The greatest landowner was the king, and uh, the king owned most of the land, and he used it to build an artificial uh, patronage system by giving royal land or turning it over to be used by his subjects. The king was guaranteeing loyalty to his followers. So uh, we, we uh, we have a very interesting lecture to come on uh, the famous uh, Jubilee in the Old Testament, and I'm, I'm quite sure you're going to find that to be very interesting. When we compare the Code of Hammurabi, interesting things like interest and usury are absolutely identical to that of Moses. In the Code of Hammurabi, if you charge more than 20% interest, that's usury. Well, that's exactly the same figure that Moses gives uh, in in his law about interest. 
So, in fact, there are an enormous number of cultural, linguistic, religious similarities between the old Babylonian period and that of the Bible. And I'm looking forward to talking with you uh, next class hour about the most striking parallel, that of the so-called Jubilee. We'll use that opportunity to pause here as we get ready to um, turn the next hour over to the discussion of this uh, important economic practice. And uh, so thanks for your attention. This is Dr. Don Fowler in his teaching on Old Testament backgrounds. This is session number six, End of Royal Divinization, The Amorites.